Okay, hello everybody and welcome to Investing with IBD sponsored by Fidelity. I'm Alyssa Kaur, Multimedia Content Editor and joining me today is my co-host Justin Nielsen, IBD's Market Research Director. And our guest today is John Kosar. He's Chief Market Strategist for Asbury Research. And on today's show, we're going to talk about the current market, why it's really important to focus on the data instead of trying to forecast what's going to happen. And we'll take a look at a few stock ideas. So welcome, John. Hi. Good to see you guys. Yeah, good to see you too, John. Well, let's go ahead and dive right in and discuss a little bit about the current market. And um, has your focus been more on the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ late, lately, or a little bit of both? Well, it's all of those and more. I okay. like to look at the relationship between the different indexes to see what's leading and what's lagging. When I think of the market, I think of the S&P 500. I think most people use the S&P as a general benchmark to see how they're doing relative to the market. Um, but uh, I think the area of focus, um, biggest area of focus for me for the past week has been the resurgence of outperformance in semis and in tech, because those tend to lead. And when those are healthy, typically the market in general was healthy. Yeah. Now today we kind of saw a little bit of resurgence in some of the more cyclical and reopening plays for a while there. Um, and uh, do you think that uh, that tech might have to correct a little bit now that it's uh, you know had this big move from the Nasdaq Composite just getting back above its 50-day moving average line to uh, reaching the highs from February? Or uh, do you think that this is you know just just a one-day thing and you don't have to really worry about it too much? It looks like a one day thing. I mean, I try not to focus too much on what happened today or what happened yesterday, but rather what's happening kind of under the hood. Um, and even though the comp, this is the comp, this is you know the broader of the two NASDAQ indexes, even though the comp had a weak day um, today, it's trying to get up above that 141.75 area you know, that you can see and it's struggling up there. But if you look at the relative performance versus the S&P 500, it actually outperformed. So it's doing what I would expect it to do. It got up to an old level. There was some profit taking up there. But when you look at the market overall, you still had outperformance that day. And in this kind of a situation, I think the outperformance is more important. Mm -hmm. Well, we're really looking forward to digging into some of Asbury's models and the metrics that you're using to track the health of the market. But first, I want to take a step back and talk about your background because you spent many years on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So talk to us about how that experience has informed your career and where you are today. It really, um, it's formed kind of how I look at markets now. I went down there in the night in the very early 1980s when I was a kid. It's in my early 20s, and um, the first thing I did is tried to look around and figure out who was making money, and uh, just try to figure out how everything worked. And back then, uh, giving away my age, but there were no computers. Uh, there certainly were no computers on the trading floor. So you saw a bunch of guys that were walking around with um, you know, the chart paper and making the X's and O's for the point and figure charts and knocking heads, you know, because they were looking down. Those seemed to be the guys that were doing the best, the guys that were focusing on price. And really what that was doing, it was telling them where breakouts were, it was telling them where support levels were. And they were using that to kind of time their buying and selling, where a lot of the guys in the pit would go by sound, you know, they would hear the roar or they would look to see who was bidding or they would look to see the guy in the corner had a big order for 500 contracts and they would try to see if they could take advantage of that. These guys were um, a lot more um, uh, calculating. They were really studying the price movement. So that got me interested in uh, that approach right away and I started at the CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, back when it was like roaring, like in 1980 and, you know, 1981. And there was a library right on the site. After you got out of work and you got your code, you could either go downstairs and get the train or you can go to the library. So I used to spend a lot of days in the library until they threw me out. Um, and I read everything I can get my hands on because the idea 
of being able to study yesterday's price to get a handle on what's going to happen tomorrow fascinated me and it still does. So when you were kind of doing this study in the library, was it books that you were reading uh, or was this more data that you were looking at? They were books. They were books by um, some of the uh, um, pioneers. Wells Wilder was one. Larry Williams had a book out then. Um, all of the guys now that uh, John Murphy, um, um, he was a mentor of mine, a guy that I wanted to be when I grew up. So I tried to read the books and understand what they were doing. And then back in those days, I mean, um, at the Board of Trade, there was a little store and you could buy the graph paper and you could buy all of the tools for drawing. So I was a bachelor and I had a kitchen um, that I never used because the table was my charts. I would get tape and tape the tip, you know, and tape them together as the chart grew, you know, the old part would fall off the edge of the table. And I never used my kitchen table and wouldn't let any of my friends go near it because that's where all my charts were. So that was my interest there is just doing everything by hand. And I think there's, um, there's no reason to do that now, obviously, but I think as a young guy feeling it instead of just seeing it, I think there's um, sort of a tactile part of that that helped me to learn. Well, and yeah. to that end, some of the stuff that you're talking about with your experience on the floor is very sensory when you're talking about the roar of the crowd and just seeing where the activity is. Yeah. How have you translated some of that into uh, you know, electronic trading where it's maybe not as sensory? That's a great question. And um, I have financial TV on all day. Mm -hmm. um, not to study it or to say, hey, I know that guy or, or that's interesting, but to kind of hear the buzz, you know, you hear every fourth word. Um, and um, sometimes maybe a place that I'm not looking at, maybe somebody on TV is talking about a sector that I'm not paying attention to, or something's going on in the corporate bond market or something's going on somewhere because you can't see everything. So having that noise in the background and sometimes the most insignificant thing to some people I'll hear that and it'll spark an idea and I'll start digging around. So that's my trading floor now is I just kind of pay attention to what the uh, crowd and it's, that's really, if you think of financial television, you know, that's the crowd. That's what everyone's looking at. Sometimes they're not looking at the right stuff, um, you know, for someone else's opinion, but they do show you what's in focus. And I think that's kind of what the floor did also in a certain way. And what differentiates your approach is uh, this focus on data really led you to create your own internal metrics. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, when I started doing this 40 years ago, it was everyone wanted to be a forecaster because that's how you got on CNBC. You know, that's how you got on television. That's how you got, you know, newspapers to quote you. Uh, I remember the first time that I was quoted in the Wall Street Journal, I, you know, you think I won the lotto. It was meaningless, but that's what young analysts were trying to do is they were trying to get noticed. And since I was from the Chicago trading floor, I wasn't like a Wall Street guy. So it was more difficult for me to get attention. So where I'm going with this in the beginning, it was forecast, forecast, forecast. You know, um, now I, I still have the urge to do it, but I try to refrain because nobody knows what's gonna happen next week and nobody knows what's gonna happen next month. Now I still use some classical charting techniques that tell me the, uh, you know, the, you know, the NASDAQs probably have another four to 5% to go on the upside if these targets are met, but that is not my primary focus. I am watching flows in and out of the various ETFs. I'm watching relative performance. Um, I look at a bunch of different stuff and I make sure that um, everything I do is driven by data. I still see what's happening in the market, but if I have a target 5% higher because of what I read on a chart, and I see the internal data that I pay so much attention to start to roll off, I'm out of there. I don't, you know, I'm not gonna wait around for a chart pattern. Um, I follow the data, you know, the day-to-day -day stuff, in my opinion, that really makes the markets move. 
That's great stuff. So uh, we're going to continue this conversation and talk a little bit more about some of the investing lessons and this importance of following the data and uh, get into some of your models in a little bit. So stay tuned, folks. Fidelity Investments is hiring now. If you have a Series 7 financial license, you'll find opportunities for both remote roles and regional center careers across the country. At Fidelity, we provide opportunities to help you change lives every day while making sure you have benefits that make an impact in your own life. Flexible work environments, training and resources to help you grow, all adapting with you throughout your career because your workplace should work for you too. Visit FidelityCareers.com to explore jobs today. Fidelity is an equal opportunity employer. Welcome back to Investing with IBD, sponsored by Fidelity. I'm Justin Nielsen here with my co-host, Allie Coram, and our guest, John Kosar. John, let's go ahead and continue our conversation and dive into this idea of doing less forecasting and more data. What uh, you, you mentioned some of these metrics, a lot of the relative performance um, you know, and these market internals. Can you get a little bit more detailed into some of these things and uh, tell us about your Asbury 6 model that you use? Yeah, that was a, I think that's a good way to explain what I look at. Um, 10 years ago, I think you could focus primarily with price, primarily on the price of a stock or the price of an ETF or an index. And that was enough to a large degree. I think um, algos, computer-driven trading is just really exploded. I read somewhere that it's 80% of the, you know, daily trading volume is algos, you know, um, you know, various computers trading back and forth with, with each other. I think that's changed the game. I can't really prove it, but to me, I think that has changed the game in a way where you're getting all this day-to-day -day volatility now. You know, the S&P opens up 30. Um, it closes down 30. It's up 40 overnight. And then you know, by the end of the day, it's down 30 again. And at the end of the week, you feel like you got hit by a truck and the market's really where it was when you started. So I started thinking instead of chasing the, uh, um, following the S&P around like a dog chasing its tail, let's see if we can follow other secondary indicators that would act as kind of a lie detector test uh, and tell you what's really going on under the hood and not where the market is this half hour segment of time. So I started putting indicators together, back testing them. Like um, I use it, um, the Asbury six, I kind of look at it as it's sort of like a hockey team. You've got six players or six, six parts of this team because one guy or two guys is going to always make a mistake. So you have another guy that's going to go behind him and pick up the puck or pick up your check or whatever it might be. So that was my thought because every indicator, uh, I think anyone that's been in this business a while gets asked, what's your favorite indicator? I don't have one because none of them are good all the time. And if you get, if you get focused on one or married on one, um, there's such a broad array of stuff. So I was like, well, what if you put together this hockey team of indicators, so to speak? And if one or two fails, you have another three or four that should be able to pick it up. And the, you know, the collective wisdom of those six should be better than any one of those indicators. And that's where the Asbury six came from. So the Asbury six are six indicators that we back tested together. They're pretty diverse. I'm actually looking at them now so I can rattle them off. Um, we look at the rate of change in the S&P 500. That's, by the way, the only one that has to do with pure price. And then we're looking at the relative performance of stocks versus high yield bonds. We're looking at um, corporate bond spreads, high yield corporate bond spreads. We're looking at investor asset flows and the spiders and the queues. We're looking at trading volume and we're looking at market breadth. So between those six, if four of the six are green or positive, then that's a positive signal for that day. So what we do is, uh, is at the end of every day is we collect these six and then we put them together and we put them up on our website. And uh, um, you know, the next day, what invariably happens with our clients now is they've really learned to lean on that. So the first thing in the morning that they do, you know, before they open, you know, is what's the A6 doing? And if it's green, it's kind of, there's nothing, you know, ominous in front of you. 
Because sometimes you'll have three or four of the Asbury 6 will turn red, the market's still going up. And that's what I love about this indicator. So it tells my clients whether they really need to be on their toes that day and really have an exit plan in place or if they can relax a little bit. Um, and, and I think that's the purpose of that. And, and do you feel like it's when there's four, I mean, that's, that's enough, but do you feel a little bit better when you have all six? You know, so is that your hockey team all kind of working together and no one's making mistakes? That's a really good question. Um, and the answer to that is if it's, it's kind of good, better, and best. They're all pointing the same way. And sometimes an indicator, just because of how it's calculated, it could you know, turn red for a day or two, and then it could pop right back again. That's the purpose of the six. So I try not to get hung up um, too much on what any um, of those indicators uh, say, and it's in the form of a table, but I will go back and look at the red ones and see, how's it look on the chart? I mean, is this, uh, is this just kind of like a mathematical um, anomaly, for lack of a better you know, description? something fell through um, a certain moving average or a certain threshold and it comes right back the next day? Or is there some damage that's taking place in uh, these spreads, this relationship between the stock and that bond or whatever it might be? Mm -hmm. So that's what I do is I kind of, first I look at it and then if I see it looks a little dicey, I'll look at each indicator and try to see if I can qualify what's happening there. Is it something I need to be worried about? Or is it something that's yeah. probably gonna resolve itself in a day or two? So another hypothetical for you, if it's split down the middle, the indicators, is that what you're doing? You're just going underneath the surface and taking a closer look at each one, or are there secondary indicators that you then turn to if the outlook is looking a little murky or mixed? That's a great question. And what I found, it's kind of like, first I built it because I thought it was a great idea. And then I had to learn how to use it, you know, and kind of found these little nuances. How do I use this? I knew it was giving me what I wanted, but I had to figure out the interpretation of it. A really good example is back in the beginning to middle of February of last year, the Asbury 6, it started going green, red, green, red. It was back and forth. We call it blinking. Now we have an expression for that. It's called blinking. And when you see it going back and forth, that usually tells you, you can draw like a little circle around that particular chart. Um, we use the S&P 500 for the bogey. So you can draw a circle around that area where the blinking is taking place underneath in the A6. And two weeks later, that's when the market fell apart. And we had that nasty move in uh, um, February, and then we finally bottomed on the 23rd of March. So while the blinking of the indicator didn't give me any reason to believe there was gonna be a nasty move like that. It told me that internally the market was churning. There was all these, and that shows uncertainty and not just in the price of the S&P, but there's uncertainty in like in the guts of the market. And that told me the market was kind of cranking up to do something big. Um, now, because at that time, the market was really overextended, I think the S&P 500 was 14% above its 200-day moving average at that time, you could handicap that a little bit and say, you know, the likelihood of this something big is probably going to be down just because the stock market is um, a mean reversion thing. You get so stretched out and then you can handicap the next big move is not likely to go. So it's 30% above the 200 day. It's likely to come back to the mean. And that's what happened. But that's how I use that tool. When it's green, 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 it's kind of steady blue sky. Um, I feel like I don't have to turn over any rocks to look for something, you know, to look for bombs that are going to go off, so to speak. When it starts to blink back and forth, now I'm starting to look in places and trying to envision what if it breaks down, where's the level that would really cause people to start throwing in the towel on their long positions. I start to look at relative performance between different indicators to see if there's any indication people are shifting into the defensive places and out of the offensive places. And now you can build a little context. Mm -hmm. And so the, the blinking itself, doesn't necessarily require action on your part, but it really kind of, again, as you said, makes you start turning over rocks and, and projecting what, what you think could happen and start preparing yourself for that and planning, right? 
Yeah, my sense of it is when you see the blinking, it tells you the market is confused is probably way too strong a word, but you're not getting a steady um, um, you're not getting a steady answer out of the market. There are parts of the market that are showing fear, like just for an example off the top of my head. Stock market's going up, um, volume's okay, um, momentum's fine, corporate bond spreads are starting to widen. So it tells you, that, you know, the bond market sees something there that it doesn't like. It may just be an anomaly, maybe for three or four days, and then you see another one. And then you use, uh, so as you see those internal changes in the market, um, it's kind of like, you know, your car could drive on three cylinders or four cylinders if it's a six cylinder car, but it's just not going to run real well. It's that kind of concept when the market isn't hitting on all six cylinders, it tells you, it gives you an early indication that there might be some trouble down the road. Right. Or that could be maybe the blinking is your check engine light. You know, that doesn't necessarily mean that your car is about no, to break down. Absolutely. But, you know, it could just be your gas cap or it could be something more serious. Um, it tells you the market is internally churning and getting ready for a tactical move. And a tactical move for me is four to six weeks, it's, you know, is a tactical move. So that's kind of how I use that is the market's getting ready for a tactical move. And then you can kind of look at the market with that kind of a context in your head and almost be able to game it out, you know, either way. Um, if this is uh, indeed like a spring, kind of a coiling area you know, where the market is fixing to make a um, uh, four to six week move either up or down, you can game it out each way. It just kind of helps you to stay a, a step ahead if you can. Prepared. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. Which I think it brings it back to the lesson aspect here, this importance of looking at the data and sort of peeling back those layers instead of forecasting what's going, going to happen in four to six months from now, this sh sort of short term look can help you be more nimble. And it, it seems like it, it gives you an edge. I think you could blend them. I think you can use you know, more classical methods to say, hey, the stock market broke this level. Um, it should go here next, as long as it stays up above the trend or whatever. And you can make some simple um, price projections. But the reading of the data every day, it tells you if it's working. And that's, I think, a lot of, I don't want to say a lot of people. Um, sometimes it's easy to get married to a forecast that you made. Yeah. Uh, and you see that a lot where somebody right. makes a forecast um, and they really put their reputation on at stake or their pride at stake on that idea. Um, and, you know, and they've either given it to their boss or, uh, you know, to the trading room or they set it on television. Uh, but now they've got um, skin in the game, so to speak. And that's a bad place to be. So, I mean, I still like to look at markets and have a sense if it breaks here it could go there but every day i'm looking at that data if that data shifts i'm out of there i'm gone um our cpm model um it's um it's in the market 66 percent of the time the beta is 0.33 on it and that's because when those metrics turn i'm out and sometimes two weeks later, I'll be right back in again. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it'll be two months later. But the point is our drawdowns are really small. And the pe people who trade the stock market, I started out in the commodity space where we were trading some of the commodity markets or it was foreign currencies or it was interest rates where if you look at a 10 year chart of a lot of these things, it looks like a sine wave. It's sideways. It could just as easily go down as up. The stock market has an inherent upward bias. So why not, you know, use that? So that was my thought. The market goes up most of the time. So if you can just kind of like, you know, the matador, Olay the bull as he's right. going by, you know, and uh, it should be Olay the bear, I guess, shouldn't it? But, <laughs> you know, you get my point. If you could get out of the way and take that money and re-engage it underneath, um, that's a huge advantage. I didn't start focusing on the stock market until I was probably 10 years into my career because I was a trading floor guy at 
and at the CMA. But that was the first thing I thought is I've got an advantage here. So let's try to build models and come up with ideas that take advantage of that. And, and again, that kind of throws, you know, all of this talk of buy and hold, you know, really kind of out the window in some ways. Uh, a lot of people are still married to this idea of, oh, if you if you're out, then you're going to miss the the rebound. But it sounds like you're keeping yourself flexible enough to where, again, you don't know if it's going to be two months or two weeks out. You're not forecasting that far into the future. You're just kind of using your indicators to say, okay, what, which way am I going to go right now? And what are the possibilities? Is that right? Yes, it is. Because you can still hold on to that you have bigger forecast that you might have six months out or three months out, but you don't have to sit there um, you know, the entire time. Um, it's okay. It doesn't cost any doesn't cost any money to trade anymore. When I first started in the business, there was a yeah. cost of doing business. That was a huge factor. Well, that's gone. So for me to move out of the queues on Tuesday and then 10 days move back into the queues, 7% underneath, didn't cost me a dime. Um, so that, uh, so you can have your cake and eat it too, so to speak. In other words, if you have a longer term forecast or you enjoy doing that, you can do that, but why not use something that keeps a finger on the pulse of what's going on day to day so you can adjust your position as the market changes? And you mentioned CPM, and just for the audience listening or watching this, that's your correction protection model. And we really appreciate this deep dive into the Asbury 6. I think it was very beneficial. And when we come back, we are going to talk about how you use sector cash flows to screen for leading stocks and take a look at a couple of individual names. So we'll check out that after the break. Fidelia Investments is hiring licensed financial professionals now. Reach your career goals with the support of a financial leader, impacting customers and employees' lives for over 70 years. We're hiring now with remote roles nationally. So if you thrive on helping others, if you're self-motivated, find career growth at Fidelity. Find stability you can count on. Find the flexibility you want and the opportunities you need. Find your Fidelity. Visit series7.fidelitycareers.com. All right, welcome back to Investing with IBD, sponsored by Fidelity. I'm here with Justin Nielsen and John Kosar. So, John, we left the audience a little bit of a cliffhanger before the break, and that's how you use sector flows to help you pick leading stocks. So can you talk about that approach? Sure. Uh, I built a model five or six years ago, and because the idea of it made so much sense to me, and it was one of those things where it took me a couple of years to really learn how to use it but it's based on sector asset flows in, ET, um, in ETFs, um, specifically in the spiders. There's 11 sector spiders. So my idea was if you look at the total assets in all 11 of those sector spiders on a daily basis, and then track how the money moves around the board. So in other words, if you're looking at that as a entity inside of itself, of itself, I guess. Um, and then you start to track the money going back and forth between sectors. So we do that in three different time periods. We do that in what we call a trading, a tactical and a strategic time period. And we measure where the money is going and where it's coming from in all three of those time frames, And then we look for trends across time frames. Asset flows are one of the few things I've ever run across in my career that tend to lead price. They don't always lead price, but they tend to lead price. So for example, um, back on November 12th, the CIF model identified energy and financials as where the money was going. You know, These were new trends at the time that was where the money was going. If somebody were to tell me on November the 12th, I think she you should buy energy and financials, I would have probably looked at them like they were a little crazy. I think the yield of the 10 year was probably 70 basis points then. Um, and energy had just gotten killed all year long. It just seemed like it was a horrible idea, but that's where the money started to go. And then I followed that trend um, week after week and month after uh, month after month. Now we just got out of the energy idea at the end of last week. I don't have the figures, but I mean, they're ridiculous. It outperformed uh, the S&P 500, maybe by 25 or 30%. And it was, I think, up close to 50 outright. 
and we're still in XLF, the financial sector. Um, and now you've got the yield of the 10 year trading double of where it was before where we uh, today, about 164, it's been trading in the 170s. Um, and now everybody likes financials. <laughs> so sometimes it takes the recognition of what's happening in the economy or what's happening in the market um, time to show itself, but you'll see the first little smoke, first little sparks of that. You'll see that in the flows going in there. So that's what we use to move money around in the sector space. We keep following the money. If something is in favor for two weeks or two months and it goes out of favor and I see the money going somewhere else, we're out of there and we're right on the next one. And uh, over time, um, it keeps you in the right spots in the market. And because all 11 of those sectors are a subset of the S&P 500, of course, you don't really get far away from the index. So it's a way to pick up a little bit of alpha in your account without any, um, any additional risk um, per se, because you're staying, you know, you're still staying in you know, the basket of stocks that most people consider the market. You're just following the money around the board is changing the weights <laughs> Pardon me? changing the weights yes yeah. exactly um so uh, that uh, there's just a lot of things i like about it i like it conceptually and i like the fact that you're not um really sticking your neck out there all you're doing is you're surfing the trends that are inside of those 11 sectors and staying on the places where the money's going Okay, so now uh, real quick, let's just uh, define. You said this is your CEF model. What is what does CEF stand for? Sector ETF asset flows. Okay, perfect. And is this giving you a sense of where you're putting your money? Of course, but are you talking about just putting it into these select uh, spiders, uh, sector spiders, or are you then drilling down and looking for individual stocks? The model itself is just um, sector rotating from spot to spot. So SEEF tells you where the money's going. It also tells you where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. So if we see it's going to financials and it's going into energy, let's talk about those two because those are the recent ones. It's going to financials and energy. It's coming from somewhere else. Uh, it was staples and um, the other one was changing you know, from this to that, but that also, it tells you the places not to be. So I'm kind of getting to your question. So what I might do is, you know, I may, uh, you know, I'm gonna buy XLE and XLF, but when I'm looking for individual stock ideas, the first place I'm gonna look are those two sectors, because I already know that I've got a little bit of a tailwind. I've got some money going there, um, more so than in the other sectors for that particular time frame. So it helps me to find sec to find individual stock ideas where I already have a little bit of a tailwind. And it also tells me on those that are out of favor, you know, where the money's coming from, I stay away from those. Um, um, Staples has been where the money's been coming from for a good part of the last two to four months. So I don't play in that uh, sandbox. You know, I wait until uh, I start seeing flows there. So it tells you what to avoid as well. And is that how you kind of got out of the energy is because stuff was flowing out of energy or was well, it because, because it was extended? The, because it shifted. It was no longer one of the top two in terms of percentage assets in, in multiple time frames. So as it fell out of favor, technology came into favor. So I basically sold my XLE and bought XLK. And now we're going to sit on XLK. I don't know if the trend's going to last two weeks or two months or six months, you don't know that. But when the money starts moving, I just move with it. And so speaking of stock ideas, let's take a look at a couple. So first we have Lowe's, ticker L, clearly a very nice uh, steady trending stock since November. Uh, what put this on your radar? We have two models um, and we call one momentum and the other one is value. So this was a momentum idea. So what we're looking for is a stock that is coming into support. And we did this quantitatively with scans. So we can scan 6,000 stocks in just a few seconds. But we look for stocks that are in uptrends, 
coming into support. Number three is showing good relative performance versus the S&P 500. And the fourth one is that a short list of internals are mostly positive. So we have like four different ways to slice and dice that. And it spits out a list of, of stocks. You know, sometimes I can go um, days or even a week or so and not see any. And then other times it'll show me 12 or 13 in a row. And that's interesting for me too, because you, know, you go quiet, quiet, quiet. And then all of a sudden your models are kicking up all these stocks. Oftentimes they'll point to a sector like uh, this morning, um, kicked up a bunch of stocks. Half of them were real estate. Now I don't see enough in real estate to make a move yet. Um, CIF hasn't picked it up yet. It, it hasn't showed up there yet. But I'm seeing that models are starting to point to a lot of real estate stocks that have a really good relative, um, or um, they're at a point where the risk reward is really good. Either they're going to start to do well now and accelerate, or in two or three days, you know, they're going to roll over. So it tells me what to watch, and it tells me what to watch at points in the market where your risk reward is good. In other words, either they have to re-engage and take off or you're out of there. So I usually give it a couple of days to show me something and then I'll start to move into those ideas. And Lowe's is one of those ideas that had met all those criteria. We put the trade on, I'm looking at my uh, chart here, on 3-2, um, 2nd of March. And uh, it's had a nice move. It's been slow and steady and it hasn't lit the world on fire. But just kind of looking across here, it's up... Uh, nine percent and it's it's also managed to outperform the s p by a little bit too which is good and i also just wanted to make sure that people understood that um when we're talking about lows here this is uh not the <laughs> not the home depot competitor yes. this is um insurance diversified and they also get into the offshore uh, uh drilling rigs and mm -hmm. um so it, you know used to be the hotels and uh, a, a lot of different things there so most definitely. Okay, let's move on to a couple of others. Talk to us about how you are trading SLX right now, because we've been talking a lot uh, internally since the beginning of the year. The steel stocks have been looking really great. So how have you been utilizing this steel ETF? Part of what I'm doing is the S&P 500 is up 90% from last March. So I'm already thinking when the inevitable correction comes, where do I go with that money? Um, it's fine, you know, to be in cash and avoid a nice downdraft. But so I've been looking at the commodity space a lot and it's spotty in there. It really is. Obviously the precious metals are doing very well. Oil struggling now. Uh, the places that I've seen um, some good relative strength um, have been, um, you know, some of the building areas, uh, steel and lumber are the two that I've been watching. So I looked at SLX uh, here and our signal for SLX was actually also a momentum signal on uh, 326. So um, not too long ago, a couple of weeks, it's up 5% since then. It's been a relative performer versus the S&P during that time, but it's had a decent move and it's had a good day today. It's made fresh eyes today and, um, um, that, um, if you take a look at that particular ETF, there's not a lot of, um, um, there's not a lot of volume there, but, um, if you run a linear correlation with that particular ETF and X, which is us steel, you know, the linear correlation is tight and stable for five years. Uh, so if somebody says, well, I'm not really comfortable trading that X, um, looks, quite the same. And now, right. that's a, you know, so that's just another way to play that idea. And I'm assuming that, you know, XME was what kind of got on your radar in terms of your spider funds. So um, did you do just another drill down there uh, to get into the steel or uh, th th this is kind of something separate, right? Uh, Cause there's, there there's very segments. similar action in mm -hmm. XM, XME as. Exactly. Actually our, um, one of our ideas uh, in terms of industry groups is XMA. That idea was put in on 222. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's been around a little bit longer. Um, and that's doing, um, 
Again, it isn't starting the world on fire here. It's up 5.2% you know, since we put it on. But that's, if you use the same methodology over and over again, which is really what I try to do that's part of the data-driven kind of theme of our shop, is you'll find a lot of similar ideas or like ideas that are coming independently at you. And that's the interesting part. You know, by, you know totally different criteria. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see it at the index level, you'll see it at the stock level. So yeah, that is something that I've kind of always got the um, antennas up for is seeing if I'm getting different ways to judge the strength of the market that are pointing at one spot that I should be paying attention to. Mm -hmm. And two more individual names that I want us to quickly hit on. And the first uh, on your list would be NASDAQ, the company NDAQ, another nice trending stock over the last couple of months. That's another momentum idea. Um, I actually have um, a note on my screen that earnings is in a week on 421. So what I'll probably do is take a good look at this thing. And if I've got a nice profit going in earnings instead of risking giving that back, um, you know, I may sit it out through earnings and maybe re-engage later. Um, since we put the ID on, it's up 7%. We put the ID on, what did I say? March the 22nd. So that's an outperformer as well. That has outperformed the S&P 5, which is really what I like to see is, you know, that, you know, relative outperformance. It's outperformed the S&P by 2.2%. It's the S&P 500 since then. And that's another momentum idea. Um, and again, financials, that's part of that CIF idea from the middle of November of last year. So there's that confluence um, of different, methodologies that are giving you the same answer. So I always like to do those if I can. And Definitely. finally, let's go ahead and get to uh, Cardalytics. Uh, the ticker symbol on that is CDLX. And uh, what, what, what was your CIF model telling you, especially since computer software, uh, this, is, this is an area where uh, the tech was under pressure and this one is uh, below its 50 day moving average line. So very different looking from the others. It is, and it's, and it's also a different model. This is our value model. And, and what we're looking at on our, our value model is we're looking for an uptrending stock that's just had a nice correction. And as you can see, we've had a nice correction there since we peaked 161.47 up there. Of, uh, what, that was um, February 16th. Um, and that's, by the way, that middle of the February period, that's when the entire tech sector started underperforming. That's what, one of the first things I saw. The stock market was, uh, you know, the broad market was doing okay, but you saw tech starting to underperform. So basically this model is looking for a stock that still has a positive strategic trend. That's the trend we're trying to catch. Um, it's at a support level and um, a small basket of internals are starting to get stronger. So I can put this on with very little risk. Uh, for this particular idea, our risk was yesterday's low. Right. Um, and so I actually bought this this morning. Uh, the stock is up 13.9 um, for the day. Um, and I'm already up 7% on the stock. I bought it mid-morning. Um, I put the idea out to clients mid-morning, um, I should say. So this is one of those where the risk reward is very good. If this trend is still intact, and once again, we have the CIF model showing money going back into technology, this should go back up and retest that 161.47 area. And if you're wrong, it's going to do an about face here over the next couple of days, and I'm going to be out of there with a very small loss. So my thought process is you do this over and over and over and over again, and more times than not, the trend is going to stay intact. Otherwise, the S&P long term, it would look like a sine wave. In fact, stocks go up most of the time. So buying a trend that appears to be re-engaging, I think it gives you kind of a little bit of a natural edge. And you know, my risk reward here is yesterday's low or fresh highs. So just kind of eyeballing this, a risk reward might be three and a half to one there. So right. I'll do those all day long. And even if I'm only right 50% of the time, which is typically not the case because you're buying an existing trend that's likely to continue, 
I'm still, because the risk reward is so good, I'm still making money on that side of the equation. So that's how I think of kind of risk reward. Um, it's not hard to get the direction of a stock right or an index right. The hard part is where to buy them and where to sell them. That's really where the rubber meets the road. That's why my models are focused on that kind of risk reward and putting the trade on when there's a little bit of risk and not after it's halfway up to the, the high again, I've right. lost my leverage at that point. Yeah, uh, it's, it's so nice when you can get those reversals. And again, you, you very quickly realize if the stock is working or not, but um, really appreciate the ideas um, yeah. uh, and sharing some of your models with us. And Great picking uh, your brain today. Yeah, those internals. And uh, um, that's going to be it for this week's Investing with IBD podcast. Uh, John, thank you so much for joining us. And next week, we're going to have on Bill Studebaker of Robo Global will be joining us then. And so make sure that you tune in. That's it for this week for investing with IBD. I'm Justin Nielsen and along with Ali Quorum, thanks for watching. And for this week's notes and charts, make sure to go to investors.com slash podcast, where you'll find details for each episode in the podcast episode section. And make sure to subscribe, rate and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you want to watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.